welcome to Bass Pro Shops. My name is Captain Dylan Hubbard with Hubbard's Marina. Uh, Hubbard's Marina has been fishing local waters since 1928. My great grandfather started our company with seven rowboats and 14 cane poles. And I'm blessed to be the son of a son of a son of a sailor. And uh, I've grown up on the back deck of our party boats and charter boats, uh, working on the water, being around the water, and learning from guys and gals like you on the boats. Uh, and blessed to work with a really great crew of captains at Hubbard's Marina. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on out there, a little bit about some of the upcoming seasons and what we're looking forward to, and then we're going to talk about whatever questions and comments you guys might have. So what I'd like to try to do is have more of a conversation. So if you guys have a question, uh, if you want to learn about something, if you hear something you want a better explanation on, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and let me know. Okay, guys? Uh, so we'll start off by talking a little bit about what's going on right now. How many of you guys, real rewind for a second, how many of you guys own your own boat uh, and regularly go offshore fishing beyond 20 miles? Do you, how about some of you guys, how many of you own your own boat that fish inside of 20 miles? Okay, a few more. All right, cool. Well, what we're going to try to do then is kind of gear a little bit towards more near shore, but if some of you guys want to ask other questions about deeper water, that's fine too. Uh, at Hubbard's Marina, we do party boat and charter boat fishing, so we have anything from near shore all the way out as well. Uh, so deep drop fishing, near shore hog fishing, whatever you guys want to talk about. What's going on right now is red snapper season just came to a close. So unfortunately, red snapper won't be available for us until around summer 2019. Uh, but in the fall, we have gag grouper are open. The hogfish start biting really well. Uh, we're looking forward to the fall kingfish run. The mackerel and kingfish uh, will start getting excited here in a few weeks. Uh, so we have a lot to look forward to this fall. Uh, the big thing on the radar right now is our August 1st opening of Amberjack season. Uh, so Amberjack are going to open up August 1st. They're going to be open August, September, and October. Uh, and every month that ends in ER is great for gag group. October, November, December are my, some of my favorite months. Right around Thanksgiving is typically around the best time. But all the way through December is pretty good too. Uh, so we have big uh, jacks, we have big gags coming up. There's a lot of opportunities to catch some really good fish. So we're excited about all that. Now as we kick this off, I just want to double check again. Everybody got a raffle ticket, right? Very good. All right. So uh, what do you guys want to talk about? Anybody have any questions to get this thing rolling? Speechless, huh? Mm hmm Hogfish and stuff? Okay. Okay. The question was, uh, on a 10-hour trip, what size hooks and weights would you need for a spinning rod? Uh, on our 10-hour trip, we're fishing about 15 to 25 miles from shore. We're fishing anywhere from about 60 to about 110 foot of water. So for that area, whether you're on our party boat, your small boat, uh, your buddy's boat, a big, huge go-fast boat, whatever it is, in that area, I would typically bring two kind of combination setups. I would typically bring uh, one of my two-speed reels, and I would typically bring a spinning rod. The reason for that is the spinning rod enables me to have some lighter, uh, lighter tackle uh, and a lighter approach for some of those hogfish, uh, some of those uh, quicker biting fish and it just is a little bit more fun, especially if the bite's a little bit slow. Using some of the lighter tackle uh, enables me to sometimes get some of those more leader shy, finicky fish uh, that wouldn't normally chew on the heavier tackle uh, to start feeding on the lighter tackle. Uh, so for the spin rod, I would typically be using about 25 to 30 pound braided line, and I would typically be using around 30 pound fluorocarbon to start. And then uh, most of the time, when I'm fishing for hogfish or I'm using a light tackle setup, I'd be using a knocker rig. Uh, but you can also use a just a single uh, jig head, uh, something like this guy right here. This is a single jig head. Uh, that way, the weight is right on the hook, and it makes it a little bit easier to feel the bite when you're using a jig head. Knocker rig, as the weight gets further from the hook, it's a little bit more difficult to feel the bite. 
Um, then the other option I would use for hogfish would be uh, the naked ball jigs. They work really well for hogfish too. So those are kind of my three go-to options. Oh, it's got a big head hanging from it. So these would be my kind of go-to options for the hogfish. The jig head, the naked ball jig, uh, or the knocker rig that I have rigged up here. And again, the knocker rig is simply an egg sinker on my main line rigged up so that egg sinker can travel up and down the main line without any restrictions. So there's no, uh, there's no swivel in the way, there's no line to line out the way. That egg sinker is going to be able to travel up and down that main line unrestricted. And you'll notice it's a very small egg sinker. A lot of times people will come out with a knocker or what they call a knocker rig and they'll have like a one or two ounce weight on it. The idea behind a knocker rig is you want that bait to descend very slowly and appear naturally. So if you use a very large weight on that knocker rig, that bait's going to go down to bottom too quickly and it's not going to appear naturally. So the idea behind a knocker rig is either you're using it for a few different reasons. You're using it for a leader shy fish, like a hogfish, or you're using it in a time when the bite is slow and the other fish aren't chewing on a normal, normal approach on a normal rig. So you're using lighter tackle. So the idea behind that knock rig is you have to make that bait appear very natural. In order to do that, using that lighter egg sinker, the further that uh, weight gets away from your hook, the slower that bait's going to descend. And that happens naturally just because the drag, the hydrodynamic drag of your bait is going to pull that weight further and further from your hook. And as it gets further and further from your hook, the slower your hook is going to descend. So that's why I like using the knocker rig setup over the jig head and the naked ball jig just because it's going, to slow, it's going to descend more slowly, look more natural, and typically give you a better chance of hooking up. But it is a lot harder to feel the bite. Uh, the other answer to your question about uh, what size weight, it depends on which type of rod I'm using. If I'm using the spinning rod with the knocker rig type setup, I'd be using around a quarter ounce to a half ounce weight in 60 to 110 foot of water. Uh, if I was using more of like a fish finder setup where I've got the egg sinker on the main line, a swivel, a leader, and a hook, on my spinning rod with that lighter braid and that long top shot, I'd probably be using about a one ounce weight, maybe a three quarter ounce weight, uh, depending on the size main line on your spinning rod. The higher the main line, the bigger the weight. On my two speed setup and my four ox setup, I'd be using about a three to four ounce lead uh, in a around 40 to 50 pound main line, maybe 60 pound main line, and then around a 40 to 60 pound leader, depending on what I'm targeting. The, for the hogfish, I really like around a four ox hook. For the grouper, I like around maybe a seven ox hook. For the mangrove snapper, five to six ox hook, typically. Answer your question. Thank you. My question was about leader. You said you use leader on the uh, spinning rod, mm -hmm. but for that setup, you're obviously not using it. This setup, I am using a leader in uh, one sense of the word, uh, in another sense of the word, I'm not. So it's a little confusing. And what I'm doing here, this is set up for hogfish. Uh, so I have braided line in my school, but I have about a 15 to 20 foot leader, but it's a top shot. Most of the time when I'm using, when I'm using a, uh, a, a normal, what I would call a normal rig, uh, which a lot of people refer to as a fish finder rig, uh, that would be uh, an egg sinker on the main line. You've got your swivel, you've got your leader and your hook. But you'll notice in the school, I've got braided line, then I've got a top shot, which is the same thing I got on that rod, and then I have my leader. So a top shot is simply a leader before the leader. In the case of that spinning rod right there, my top shot is my leader. So uh, that's all That's all the confusion is there. And the idea behind it, uh, are you fish with braided line at all? Uh, the idea behind the top shot, do you use a top shot? Uh, I think I have one on the phone. Yeah. The idea behind the top shot is what it does is it creates a shock absorber. Because when you fish straight braided line uh, to your swivel, it's not a good idea. 
because as you drop to bottom, that bait's going to spin a little bit, or even if it doesn't spin, that braid doesn't have any stiffness or memory. A lot of times, by the time you hit bottom, you're going to be tangled up. You reel it up, and your braid's tangled around your weight, and tangled around your swivel, and it doesn't look natural on the bottom. Plus, that braid is very easy for a fish to see under the bottom. Plus, braided line doesn't have any shock. So when you add a top shot on top of that braided line, it's like a shock absorber. So not only is your rod flexing, but that braid, that monofilament top shot or fluorocarbon top shot is flexing. So a lot of times when you're fishing straight braid, that fish is able to tear a hole in the side of its mouth and you'll lose the fish. I remember when braid first came out, it was like, oh, the new technology, everybody's got to switch to it. I remember rigging one of my snapper rods with it and I missed, I lost so many fish that first trip. I would hook them, I'd be able to feel everything. It was awesome. The sensitivity was great. And I'd hook them, get them up off the bottom, and once I was up off the bottom, they would just come unhooked. And I couldn't figure out what was going on until I finally caught on that that braid line, it doesn't have any shock absorption. And so that fish just tears a hole in the side of his face because he's shaking his head, biting him, and he's able to spit that hook on the way to the surface very easy. Especially snap, they're very smart. So once they lose sight of the bottom, they know they're not gonna break you off or get you in the bottom. So once they lose sight of the bottom, what well, a lot of times they'll do is they'll swim up straight at the boat with their mouth open, shaking their head. And if you slow down, he's gonna be able to spit your hook. So mangrove snapper especially, I can tell you if I got a mangrove snapper on in 400 foot of water because he just bites the same way every time. Real aggressive right off the bottom, a real aggressive bite. You get him up off the bottom and he almost stops fighting. Your rod tip, he's shaking his head and all of a sudden he'll just stop. And that's him swimming up to the uh, boat as fast as he can. And if you stop, a lot of times you'll see that happen. The rod stops moving, people stop feeling the fish bite, and they'll stop like, oh, is he still on there? That's when he spits your hook, then he's not on there. So with the, especially with the snapper, you guys continue to crank. You can't stop cranking. And that's why a two-speed reel works so well. I'll start in the high-speed mode. I'll hook the fish. If it's a big fish and I can't get it off the bottom, I'll shift gears, downshift into the low gear get him up off the bottom, and once he's up off the bottom, I'll put it back into high speed mode, because at that point, I don't need any power. I just want to finesse that fish, and I want to keep that speed capability, because in case he starts swimming up to the boat, I can keep pressure on him. I always tell people jokingly, but it's very serious, if any of you have played a fishing game, I know there's all those fishing apps out there, and you hit the button to reel in, and you'll see the, the pressure gauge, that needle's fluctuating and you gotta keep that needle in a certain spot. It's the same idea offshore. You gotta keep tension on that rod tip. If you let that fish swim up towards the boat and that rod tip comes up and there's no tension, he's gonna spit your hook. So it's the same idea offshore. You keep tension and if he starts digging, you gotta lower your rod tip and stop reeling. Or else that gauge is gonna go up too high and you're gonna break the fish off. Or bend your hook. Or he's gonna pull the hook out of the side of his face. So it's a joke, but it also, when you get in that mindset, it helps you a lot. Did, you have, did I answer your question first? What was your question? Triple tip. Triple tip? Triple tip? Triple tail is a great fish to target if you have a smaller bait boat or you have a skiff. Uh, it's a little difficult to target in a, a larger vessel just because they're really spooky. Uh, but we've caught triple tail 110 miles from John's Pass on a 63 hour, 800 foot of water. So you never know. Um, but how I would target triple tail is especially in the Tampa Bay area or along our beaches uh, during stone crab season, uh, during blue crab season, and all throughout the year we have these crab traps and bait traps offshore. And what they are, are especially stone crab season, is a great time for triple tail uh, because it's in the fall typically when the water's a little chillier and the water's clear so it's easy to see them. And those stone crab traps might as well be big chum blocks. The fishermen, the crabbers, they fill them up with dead bait uh, to attract the crabs. And what will happen is that will also attract bait. And then you've got this line, this uh, neoprene or some kind of plastic line that goes up to the buoy. And that buoy is going to hold uh, all that bait. That line is going to hold all that bait. And these triple tail will hang out underneath the buoy. 
and they'll kind of float there kind of awkwardly and they'll uh, try to hit those shrimp and those smaller bait fish that get attracted in. So what a lot of guys do who target triple tail and the guys who post photos of triple tail all the time, what they typically have is they have a tower on their bay boat. You don't have to have a tower, you can do it without one. Uh, but a, a tower really helps so you're able to see further. Uh, a good pair of glasses uh, works obviously is mandatory. And you're sight fishing those uh, triple tail. Uh, we just luck into them sometimes on the party boat. I've caught them from our charter boat. I've caught them from the party boat. Uh, you're cruising along, you see a crab trap, you'll get over near it, and you'll see that telltale black piece of uh, debris or something looks like sitting under that trap. And that's a triple tail. Uh, and what kind of boat do you have? Ginyu. Uh, what? Ginyu. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Uh, with the Ginyu, you're really set up because uh, is it an electric motor or is it a... I got a gas and I got a control motor. Okay, well, uh, if you have a trolling motor, then I would recommend trolling motoring down that line. But uh, you can just run fast down the line if you see a triple tail circle around and come back on your patrolling motor. The good part about triple tail is they are very spooky, but as long as you don't like run them over, they don't get spooked. What spooks them is putting it in and out of gear. That lower unit on an outboard engine is so loud in the water when you put it in and out of gear. It's like a firecracker going off. So never do that. Uh, what I always uh, try to do is I look at the wind and I try to set up a drift because with our boats, Diesel engines are very loud, uh, so we'll try to set up a drift and let the boat kind of drift past that buoy. Uh, a good way to cheat, uh, I learned this guy, from a guy at uh, National Marine Fishery, he, he's from uh, South Carolina, and he does triple tail, triple tail charters. Uh, apparently, it's really big in South Carolina. And what he told me is to use one of those popping corks uh, because the popping cork allows you a lot of weight, and so you got a good distance. Because one of my favorite ways to target triple tail is just a three-line shrimp. And it's very difficult to cast a three-line shrimp, especially if there's any type of breeze. Uh, so you don't have very much casting distance, and if you have clients on board trying to cast these three-line shrimp, they're not knowing what they're doing, they, they don't have much of a shot. So the popping cork works really well because it gives you that weight to cast, and you can cast past. You don't want to throw that popping cork near the buoy because you're going to scoop it. So you cast past them and then reel that popping cork back to the buoy. And that shrimp is only has to be maybe six to ten inches underneath that cork. And as as it uh, as you reel it back into the buoy, just stop it maybe five six feet from the fish and then just slowly retrieve it back to them. And it's going to take it as it cruises by. I've used that method with a lot of success lately. So. That's a good good idea. And you can get a lucky one uh, triple tail. I've seen a lot of different other ways too. Greenbacks work as well as shrimp? Greenbacks work, yep. Uh, any type of small live bait shrimp is just more readily available for us. Uh, so that's typically what we're using. But greenbacks will work. Even a chunk of dead bait will work. Uh, I've had the most success with shrimp. But even a DOA shrimp, an artificial shrimp, will work as well. Okay. Uh, no worries. And they just changed the law on triple tail. Uh, I think July 1st, went from 15 to 18 inches, so you gotta get a big one now. Yeah. Reading the bottom of the sheet is uh, something very difficult to talk about in a seminar. I'll be more than happy to try to illustrate it, but without you and I being on the boat together to look at the screen, or without a TV here to show me, or to show you, it's very difficult. But I can tell you, I worked with uh, Salt Strong, the group reports. Did you watch all the videos? Yeah, when I go out, I like to put that on the see the same thing you see. I got you. What he's talking about is with Salt Strong, we filmed a uh, bottom fishing mastery course, and we did a whole section on how to read the bottom machine and how to uh, position your boat. Uh, so that was a great way. So many times at a seminar, someone asked me, how do I read my bottom machine? And it's impossible for me to try to sit up here and try to uh, illustrate that. Uh, but Salt Strong, actually, we went out on the boat for three days and filmed those uh, fishing courses right on the boat. 
uh, so they're filmed and they do this stuff, which is pretty unique. Uh, so you can check that out if you so choose. Uh, but what kind of bottle machine do you use? A garment? Well, that's your first problem. Yeah. Yeah, the second half. Uh, not so much that. You're looking at the second echo. So what we're talking about, guys, is the bottom machine. How to read your machine. Uh, each bottom machine is a little bit different, but the main idea behind them are all the same. I jokingly said that about Garmin bottom machines, just because personally, I really don't like Garmin bottom machines. Garmin makes the best, in my opinion, uh, GPS plotters. They're some of the best on the market. I really like Garmin uh, GPS plotters, but their bottom machines. I don't like it much. Uh, Simrad, Lorance, Bruno. I personally use Bruno across our boats. Bruno is one of our favorites, especially a thousand foot of water. Bruno is the best. Uh, but with any bottom machine, I have a Garmin bottom machine. I'm flying up one. Uh, I was using it yesterday, so I'm familiar with the Garmin bottom machine. And the idea is on every bottom machine, you see the bottom. And the bottom can get thicker and thinner depending on the density of the bottom. And then what a lot of people will do is they'll be too zoomed in on the bottom and you can't see anything below it. I zoom way out so I can see the entire profile of the bottom. I can see the fish show on top of it and then I can see the second echo. The second echo is that stuff below the bottom. Because the good idea behind the second echo is you can have a real thick area that shows fairly hard, but if that second echo below it is solid, that means it's really hard, like solid problem. Then you have some areas that's like more shell bottom, or you have some areas where you have hard bottom hatches and sand mixed in, and that'll all appear the same on that first uh, set of bottom, but that second echo will change ever so slightly, and you'll be able to tell the difference really, really hard and just kind of hard. So over time, it takes a lot of practice learning your machine and just viewing that second echo. And you're not looking at the width of that second echo as much as you are looking at the density. If that second echo gets more and more dense, that's what you're looking for. It'll also get uh, wider as well. But look at the density. On my machine, on a Bruno, it's red. So the second echo is always yellow. And then all of a sudden, you'll have a real thick, dense yellow patch with some red sprinkled in. And that's a really, really good shift. Or a really, really good hard piece of box. So it really just kind of comes down to your bottom machine. Did that answer what you were asking about? Yeah. We can talk more after as well. We can walk over to the electronics and I'll show you what I mean. Because they have the electronics playing in demo mode, so I can show you on the screen. Any other questions? On your 12-hour extreme, what's the best thing to bring? The 12-hour extreme. Uh, the 12-hour extreme uh, is on our flying hut too. The fish is about 70 to 100 miles from the shore. Anywhere from about 120 to about 280, 300 foot of water. Uh, so out there in that deeper water, especially on that go-fast boat, because our 39-hour and 44-hour fish is that same area, but you're on a larger, slower boat. You have a lot more time and control. You need stuff to sleep with because it's a longer trip. So on a 39-hour, you're going to bring a bunch of stuff. On a 12-hour extreme, it's a very short trip on a go-fast boat, so you want to try to minimize the amount of stuff. Instead of bringing my big tackle box, I might just bring a Ziploc bag with some tackle from it and stuff that in my backpack. That way I'm consolidating. So it's kind of two different schools of thought there. Uh, but as far as the 12-hour extreme goes, I would probably fish most of the time uh, with one of these big two-speed reels, or I mean, one of these big six-hour reels, excuse me, or a, a bigger nine-hour reel, uh, depending on what you're going after. Like, for example, this time of year, coming up, we have Amberjack open. So I would probably bring that big nine-hour reel, and then I'd always bring my two-speed reel with me as well for the snapper. Uh, but I'd make sure that I'm bringing my bigger two-speed because you have different options. You have like the Dial of Saltis and the Saltiga. The Saltiga is going to have a lot more drag. This has about 40 to 45 pounds of drag to it, so I'm able to catch a pretty decent sized fish in low gear with the drag turned all the way up. 
uh, whereas some of the two-speed reels you see on the market only have 30, 35 pounds of drag, 20 pounds of drag. And that's just not enough for the 12-hour stream trip. Uh, whereas those bigger uh, nine-on reels are going to have upwards of 50 pounds of drag, and you have a real low gear ratio that allows you to pull that big fish up off the bottom. The lower the gear ratio, the higher the power. The higher the gear ratio, the lower the power. Okay, and then also, can they, um, I've seen on your website, can they, you can buy a meal packing, or do you, that would be easier than trying to bring yeah. food and all that? Yeah, you're welcome to bring a small cooler with your own food, or you can bring a bag of food and stick it in our cooler, because we have a big cooler on the boat for everybody's food and drink. Uh, but we do offer a meal package on all of our trips. When you're on the larger party boats, the meal package includes hot food, cold drinks, soda, water, and the works. We do food cooked to order. On the go-fast boat, we don't have the galleys, so it, it's uh, deli-style sandwiches, chips, granola bars, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you have a meal package option on every single one of our trips, and all the meal packages come with unlimited free water. So on the go-fast boat, that's a big benefit. Because instead of bringing your own case of water and you know, a bunch of sandwiches and stuff, it's all sitting on the boat ready for you. Bananas and all of them, so <laughs> nice try. I snuck that in there. Uh, someone asked me the other day uh, about bananas, and he, he was he has problems. He had some type of uh, basically I don't know what it was. I don't remember, but uh, he cramps up a lot. So a lot of people were like, well, I bring bananas to help me not uh, cramp up. Uh, a good option that we use is pickle juice. Pickle juice works really well. So a jar of pickles on a 39-hour, 44-hour, 63-hour is always a good idea. Is that pickle juice will do the same thing for you. But no bananas. Bad luck on the fishing boat. Any other questions? We covered it all? Everything? Now we're going to bring up props to the same Sheriff of Vanessa, yeah. for catching the two idiots that shot the stuff with the bow and arrow right off the Who heard about the bow and arrow incident? Everybody? For those of you who don't know, somebody was caught in John's Pass bow fishing for snook on one of the most highly surveilled docks in John's Pass <laughs> uh, with some of the best infrared cameras I've ever seen. Uh, and just perfect, clear images of themselves and the truck and everything. And uh, they got caught, I think, two days ago, so that was pretty cool. Definitely uh, will be interesting to see how they get punished. Killing nine smoke illegally, out of season, going to slot and under slot. They didn't even keep them, did they? No, they threw them in a bush. Left them. Left them. Yeah. They didn't take them. That would probably be their argument, too. Yeah. Something we talked about earlier, you said they could bring up with some birthdays and discounts. And yeah. Birthdays. Our free birthday trip. So how it works, uh, we, I'll be honest with you, I stole it straight up from the Texas Cattle Company. So shout out to them. Uh, but how it works is the same way at Texas Cattle Company. You have to have someone with you, uh, and it has to be your actual birthday. Uh, and so when it's your actual birthday and you have someone coming with you who's paying full price, you get your, a free trip on your birthday. Five, 10 hour trip, absolutely free. Uh, if you do a longer trip, like a 12 hour, a 39 hour, a 44 hour, you can take uh, 10 hour trips fair often, so it's 90 bucks. So let's say your birthday is on a Saturday and you want to do that Friday at 39 hour, because you're offshore during your birthday, you can get $90 off if you bring someone with you. But you have to book on your actual birthday, you have to have a uh, photo ID to prove that it's your birthday as well. So we're not too strict. You can't do it on and you can't do it online. <laughs> any, any discounted reservations has to be made over the phone, yes. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, uh, that is a great question. What she was asking is, does she need Bray or not uh, for this upcoming 10 hour trip uh, on her spinning rod? The only reason I use Bray. Uh, are for select situations. I like using great when trolling because it gives me more line capacity in the reel if I hook a big, huge trophy fish. I use uh, great line for vertical jigging because it gives me more sensitivity and I'm able to set that hook easier because there's less stretch in the line. 
and I'll use vertical or I'll use braid line when I'm snapper fishing or hog fishing for increased sensitivity. Uh, but for the most part, I like using monofilament. You'll notice all the big rods I have up here have zero braid. Braid. When I'm fishing for amberjack, grouper, uh, the bigger fish, I don't like using braid. You fish for an amberjack, you catch 12 amberjack on braided line with a short top shot, you won't be able to put your arm down. It'll bruise you so bad. That stretch, that monofilament will save you. Uh, so I like using monofilament when I'm fishing for uh, grouper, amberjack, other stuff. But as far as fishing for hogfish, or fishing for snapper, or vertical jigging, you can still do that with mono. Mono isn't bad, and you don't have to have braid. If you fish mono, you have a lot less problems in your life. Uh, you're gonna have a lot less tangles. Uh, it's gonna be a lot easier on you. So you don't have to learn the line to line knots. It simplifies a lot. The only downside is you lose a little bit of sensitivity. You don't have as much line capacity. About a 10 hour trip fishing less than 100 foot of water, there's no real need for uh, braid line. And your sensitivity is there. The only time you worry about sensitivity is when you're fishing 150, 200, 350 for water. Braid's going to make a big difference. Uh, on a six out reel, uh, I'd be using that for anywhere from red grouper, gad grouper, to smaller amberjack, and I'm typically running about 60 pounds all on a six out, six out reel with a 60 to 80 pound leader. On the nine out, I have anywhere between a 80 to 100 pound with a 100 to 125 pound leader. The idea with the bigger stuff is it's real simple, easy to use, they're bulletproof. I prefer to fish with this dial saltillo almost all the time. Again, because uh, it's uh, the, the dial saltis and the dial saltillo are my two kind of go-tos. The saltis is uh, a little bit more affordable, uh, but it has less drag and a little less power. The Saltiga is more expensive, it's the next level up, but its frame is one solid piece of metal. Uh, the gears are metal, or some type of forge, I forget what you told me. But it, the gears are stronger, uh, it's a three floating spool, so there's less restriction when I'm casting or when I'm real retreating. So it's a lot smoother, a lot stronger, and I have about 10 pounds more drag to this reel. But they both work very well. I've caught plenty of big red grouper and some nice sized gags with this. And I've caught some really monster red grouper and some really, really nice gags with this one. Uh, but they make even stronger two speed reels. Like Accurate has an ATV series. And that Accurate ATV series, they have one with 65 pounds of drag. And I would never want to find out what that feels like. That would be crazy. So there, there are some two speed reels with really crazy. Uh, amounts of drag, but the accurate two speeds are spending 600, 700, 800 dollars for the reel. Whereas that Dial Saltiga is expensive, but it's only 4.99, and you get 10% off when you book the trip. Well, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, and on your web, on the website, you're saying that you guys teamed up with a different rod company, mm -hmm. and you're going to you sell yeah. reels and the rods. So this is my uh, Hubbard's Marine and Killer Stick. Uh, it's our custom rod that we made uh, back four or five years ago, my father and I developed. One of the big differences with our rods is we're taller guys, me and my dad. Uh, so our butts, the butt of the rod is longer than most. That way you can hold your reel out further. But even this butt, I still end up putting it almost not even under my arm. So the new rod I just made is even longer, so it's more comfortable and ergonomical. Even if you're not a tall guy, when you hold your reel out further, you have more power. It's just physics, because you have a longer throw of your hand. So I like the longer butt for that reason. Uh, the foregrip on the new rod we made up is also an inch longer, and it's tapered. So if you don't have a huge hand, uh, there's still a good foregrip for you that's more comfortable. If you hook a big fish, you're able to double hand it really, really well. Uh, so that, uh, it's got longer butt, taper foregrip, and then the company we went with is called Bull Bay Rods. Uh, they work with the real animals and a bunch of other pros, and they make a really high quality product. So instead of these plastic real seats, it's going to be anodized, corrosion plated metal. I think it's aluminum, if I remember correctly. And then we're going to have really, really unique 
uh, premium corrosion plate guides uh, that will last a lifetime, I'm told. And it's going to be a really super light. Like these, these rods are some of the lightest rods I've ever fished with. And they're half the weight of these. So they're going to be super light. They're going to be super strong. That one's a 20 to 40. The ones we got with them, we have a 30 to 80. So this rod right here, this big old heavy broomstick that hurts your back will pick up. And after you fish with for a while, your arms hurt. This huge heavy broomstick I'm going to replace with a rod that's probably around this width, or maybe a little bit thicker. And it's going to be the same lightweight as this rod, but it's going to have more strength than this rod does currently. So it's going to be really, really cool. Uh, they're going to hopefully be done in the next couple weeks, uh, but we'll be doing video announcements about it. We'll be putting in our email. We're only going to get a really small supply up front, uh, but then we're going to go a uh, bigger supply once we uh, bring them to the shop and see how they work. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to it, and you'll be able to customize it. If you uh, like the rod, you can change the color, you can add your name to it, you can do whatever. Uh, so there's some customization options too. And then Bass Pro Shops, we're going to work with Bass Pro Shops to also make another line. Because those are going to be $250, $280 rods. We're going to work with Bass Pro Shops to come out with another line to replace this one. Because these rods are only $130. Uh, so we're going to come out with Bass Pro to make the line of covered spring of rods that will sell here in the shop. That will be a little bit more affordable. So, exciting stuff to come. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the shameless plug there. <laughs> I do not like a level line reel, uh, just simply because I, I, I'm kind of OCD, so when I'm reeling in a fish, I like to use my uh, thumb to level line myself, and plus I feel like when I get a really big fish on, I've seen it, uh, where I'm, uh, somebody hooks a fish and they can't bite it, or it gets tangled around the anchor line and I have to hold the rod, and I'm watching. And as that line's peeling out, the drag's peeling out, I'm seeing that line hit that level line and then turn directions. And that's creating friction on the line. So in my mind, a level line, if I hook a really big fish, it's going to create friction and rub and maybe cause me to lose fish. So I just personally don't like them. There's no real harm in them. I've never seen anything say that this does not work for a lot of fish. They, they work fine in a lot of people. Use them. Uh, and if you're not familiar with using a conventional reel, a level line might be a good idea for you because it is difficult and it is easy, especially when you get a young kid using a big uh, conventional reel in deep water. Uh, if they're holding it crooked or they're not paying attention, all the lines can pile up on one side, and then the reel won't function properly. Uh, so you have to hold this reel uh, stable, flat when you're retrieving line and a lot of times you have to pay attention and move that line with your thumb especially when you're fishing 150 250 300 foot of water because if you reel 350 400 uh, feet of line into this reel and you're holding it like this it's going to pile up on one side and the reel won't function uh, so that's why a level line is good in some cases so it really just depends on your application me personally i don't like level lines but i'm not saying they don't work and the other, I have actually, uh, I used to have a rod that was a level line, and all I did was unscrew it and take the level line off instead of using it. Uh, so you can, you can have that option too. They make, uh, once you unscrew it, you can pull that, those bars out, and you can still use the rod without the level line. But it's a personal preference, I think. Are you mentioning the model eyewear? What way do you recommend the best? For what? For I wear. I wear. Like some people say Costa and then 25 other people will cuss Costa out. I think sunglasses are a lot like your favorite purse, you know? <laughs> it's just brand, brand preference. Uh, to me, it, just a little backstory, I, I've been fishing since I was younger than this guy up here. So I've, I've always used Costa because that's what my dad used and that was the company that was around back then. And that was, that's what everybody used. But then I went to college and all the frat guys had costly sunglasses and scary shoes and got army shirts. That's what I always wore. So I kind of went away from that for a while. I used Smith. 
Uh, Smith is a really, really good American-made company. I've used Maui Gym. Maui Gym is an awesome pair of sunglasses. Uh, but I personally, uh, where are I? Right. No, I personally use the Costas, uh, and the Costas always got stuck with. They just have really, really good frame yeah, choices. Regular life, yeah, yeah. I loosen my brake on. I drop them in the water. Um, to me, it's a cost of doing business. Uh, is I need them as a tool. It's just like my fire, so I can't go fishing without my glasses. Uh, so, I mean, not broken. I'm not saying they're the best uh, in the world. Hey, sometimes the, the, the blue coating will rub off occasionally. Uh, there are some frames that cost the makes where they have like rubber, and that rubber will rub off. Uh, so it just depends on the frame. I really like these frames because I've got a really big head and uh, they tend to cover a lot because I want to make sure that I'm covering uh, my eyes totally. A lot of times I'll see guys who go out and get a uh, pair of glasses that are too small for their face and it let too much sunlight in and they don't work. Uh, whereas these things, like, they just totally cover everything up. So that way I don't have any sunlight getting in and I can see without any glare really easily. Uh, but I would recommend uh, Maui Jim, Smith, uh, Coast Costa, or Costa, however you want to say it. Um, I would recommend them all. And they have a huge sunglass department here. Well, I have to wear prescription when I wear sunglasses, so. And Costa have, does that. I have to wear prescription when I wear sunglasses. And Costa does that. I have to wear prescription when I wear sunglasses. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to see if I could get the, the, Costa does do that? The, yeah, Costa does do that. I, what I would recommend to you is going on the Costa website just because it, I, I won't sit up here and say, well, this is the best brand of sunglasses because no one pays me to say it yet. But uh, uh, I would suggest to you looking at the color. Uh, the mirror is a big, big component. Blue mirrored glass is for offshore open water. Green mirrored glass is inshore. Uh, silver mirrored glass is, yeah, daily bad. Black is for daily use. It's not, a, a black non mirrored lens is not for on water fishing. That's for daily driving. Copper is just, uh, I think copper is the low light. Uh, the copper mirror is for low light. It's like overcast. Uh, but I, I just call my glasses are blue. Uh, yeah, right. sure. yeah. At least I don't have a daily driver set. I just have one pair of glasses until I lose one. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, so he was just reinforcing the fact that your optometrist can't get close to uh, so I, I know Smith does that as well, and I know how it is as well. And pretty much any big company is going to be able to put your prescription lenses in the frames. No worries. Any other uh, questions? Mm -hmm. um, the question is hooks, uh, J hooks versus circle hooks. Uh, the law states when you're offshore fishing in federal waters for a lot of reef species with natural bait, you have to use a circle hook. That's the law. Uh, at Hubbard's Marine, if you run a rod and reel, we have to supply you with a circle hook because that's the law. Uh, I personally, on my personal rods, can choose to do what I want. And uh, it's America. Uh, and I. I personally prefer to use J hooks when I'm fishing for smaller fish that are going to bite quickly. Only reason why is because I'm using the right uh, tool. Uh, these D hookers allow me a, a lot of ability to be able to D hook the fish very easily and very quickly uh, without uh, bringing harm to the fish. The idea behind the circle hook wall. Uh, it was passed, in my opinion, uh, too quickly without enough uh, research and economic impact. There's no economic impact study. I mean, they still sell 10 uh I even grabbed it to prove the point. They still sell 10 odd J hooks over there. You don't use those in fresh water. This is meant to be offshore in federal water, so it doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, I personally prefer to use J hooks just because of the simple fact that if you're using the right tool for the job, it doesn't matter what kind of hook you're using. Uh, you can unhook your fish quickly. 
So let's pretend this diamond jig is my fish. So I'm going to hook it on my double snell rig there. So my diamond jig is my fish. All I'm going to go do is I'm going to grab the hook that I'm using, hold it at a 45 degree angle away from my hand that's holding the leader line, and just pull the trigger on my uh, D hooker. And it's going to turn the hook upside down. And all I have to do is shake it, and that fish is going to fall right off. So if you're using the right tool for the job, it doesn't matter what hook what type of hooks you're using. You're going to be able to unhook that fish quickly and easily. The idea behind that circle hook rule was uh, to, in order to lower the number of dead discards. Uh, discards, discard mortality is one of the uh, problems with our red snapper fishery. Red snappers close 11 months out of the year. And those months that they're closed, we are landing thousands of pounds of red snapper, and that's being taken out of our quota. The reason why is when you're offshore fishing for red snapper, or when you're offshore fishing for grouper or something else, and you catch a red snapper, they say 20% of those red snappers you catch and release die, and they take that out of our quota. Now, I would say it's probably closer to like 5 8% for myself. But I see plenty of recreational anglers who don't know how to vent to fish, or don't know how to descend to fish, and don't know how to unhook a fish properly. And they're over there with needle nose pliers, digging down his throat, ripping its gill rakers, and then throw it back in the water without venting or descending. If you're fishing past 70, 80, 90 foot of water, and you're not using a uh, venting tool, or you're not using a descending device, you are gonna kill most of the fish you release, if not all of those fish. Uh, so what's barrel trauma is what it's called. It's just an expansion of gases and that fish, it, it, it stops that fish from being able to return to bottom. So whenever you're fishing in the summertime, whenever you're fishing past 70, 80 foot of water, you have to bank or descend your fish. In the wintertime when the water's cool, if you're fishing past 90, 100 foot of water, when you got to bank or descend your fish. Some fish are more susceptible than others. Red snapper is one of the most susceptible in my mind and very fragile. Even a big, huge 20 pound red snapper, if you don't vent it and get it back in the water very quickly, it's gonna die. In short, we have this huge, huge body of people. How many of you guys know what the Tampa Bay Fishing Club is? All right, for those of you who don't, it's an online fishing forum, basically. When someone posts a photo of the Tampa Bay Fishing Club, holding a snook like a bass, let the weight of that snook hang on the lip, they just get torn apart, comment after comment, Colin, I'm an idiot. Anybody know why you can't do that? It breaks the jaw of a snook, it kills them over time. Everybody familiar with that? Well, that same mentality, that same awareness is what I want for venting a fish. Because during red snapper season, I can't tell you how many photos I saw of guys holding up this red snapper. Oh yeah! And then you see in the background behind them six dead red snapper float. That is so terrible for our industry. It's terrible for us as recreational anglers and makes us all look bad. That picture should get just as much uh, negative comments as that guy that holding that smoke in my mind, if not more. Because that guy single-handedly, he's over his limit. He, not only did he keep the two red snapper he uh, put in the cooler, but he also killed 20 red snapper that he released trying to wait for that bigger fish. So it's very important you know how to properly vent a fish or properly descend a fish so that way when you're out there offshore fishing, you're doing that properly and get those fish back in the water quickly. It's the same idea with like trout. Trout are really fragile in fresh water or in, in near shore shallower waters. And people say, oh, when you bring the fish out of the water, you should hold your breath, and you need to put that fish back in the water before you run out of breath. It's the same thing offshore, but somehow there's a disconnect. I see it all the time. People get offshore and they unhook the fish, let it sit on the deck while they're rigging up their next bait before they reach over and throw it back over. If you wouldn't do that to a trout in shore, you wouldn't grab that trout with a dry, uh, dry towel to unhook it, no. But offshore, it seems like there's some type of disconnect there. And I see that a lot in the party boat. And I really try hard to overcome that because we have to be stewards of our fishery, just like everybody is in the freshwater ponds with bass, and everybody is with snook and trout inshore. We need to be the same way offshore.
What does the towel do to dry so towel? That's my soapbox of the seminar. What the dry it? towel uh, takes away slime. The slime coating of a fish is it's protective uh, at the exterior, similar to our skin. Our skin protects us from a lot of disease. If you have a cut, you're susceptible to get uh, infections, bacteria, diseases. A uh, fish, if you take a dry towel on the side of the fish, it's like I just ripped all your skin off. And then you're going to get a bacterial infection or you're going to get a, a virus. You're going to have a lot of health problems. Well, the fish can't go to a doctor. So when you, when you hit them with that dry towel or you drop them on a hot metal deck, it rips that slime coating off and that fish is going to die. So we all have to work together. And that's why I love this tool because I got it attached with my belt. I have my venting tool, I have my line cutter, and I have my de-hooking tool all right on my person. That way at all times I can quickly unhook, or first of all, I would, if I caught a red snapper out of season, I'd hold it along the side of the boat, poke that venting hole into it, make sure it's vented properly, then I grab that hook and I get it back in the water. So it's out of the water for maybe all of 15, 20 seconds at most. So it, really decreases the chance of it floating away and dying. And most of the time, if you get that fish back in the water very quickly, you almost don't have to vent it, but venting it properly and quickly is very, very important. We have a lot of information on how to vent a fish properly on every single one of our website pages for 12-hour trips or longer. So if you go to our 12, 39, 44, 63 hour fishing trip pages, at the bottom you'll we'll see a section on how to properly vent a fish. Or you can always hit us on the contact page or message me through the Hubbard's Grand Facebook page and I'll send you the whole article, uh, Salt Strong Helping Develop, with a video on how to properly vent a fish. Thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions? I think we're about done on time, unfortunately. Uh, we got another time for another question. Unless we don't have any other questions. All right, well, uh, I'll wrap this thing up, guys. Again, uh, if someone can hit stop on that uh, video recorder, if someone knows how to. Uh, so again, uh, Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. If you guys have any more questions, you can look us up at hubbardsmarina.com.